it was funny when I called you because I was on your street and I was like, I'm not really sure where I am. You said, just look for the 200 pound tarpon on the, on the garage there. The garage. And there it was. And, and then walking in your home here, which thank you so much for inviting us over You're and so making welcome. the time. I mean, I can now it, the whole Millhouse podcast is starting to make sense because this is like a little history of saltwater fly fishing in your home here in Florida. It's really amazing. You know, Mill House just makes sense because it's my son and I, and this is the house of Mill, um, which basically represents just my, my son and I, but two, uh, the house of Mill can represent a mountain house and a Florida house, but we have a big house as far as our relationship with the ocean in the mountains and the ringtone Mill House just, I, I just think it sounded good, you know? Yeah, but the stories you're capturing, and that's really why I wanted to reach out and why I did is, you know, I started listening to the Millhouse podcast with you and Nikki, and I just loved these characters you guys are chronicling and, and getting down on tape um, for, you know, posterity of all these really interesting guys. You've gotten some very famous guys like Flip Pallet and Stu Apt, but there's been a lot of interesting captains and stuff I had never heard of, and now I feel like I've gotten to know them through your podcast. Well, it's important to record the events and the evolution and the transition of our sport. And you don't have to be famous or an icon to have played a role in that. But also, too, I think what's really important, and somebody told me this a long time ago, if you hear about Aunt Mary's farm burns down, you're going to be more inclined to care if you know who Aunt Mary is. So one of the objectives is to find out how or who Aunt Mary is in each of our guests. Because a lot of the stories are not about fishing. Sure. They're about life. Yeah. And like Nathaniel Linville, the first half hour of the, of the podcast was talking about his heroin addiction and how fishing saved his life. And that is a classic example of what really people, that I think people gravitate to, is not just catching a fish, mm -hmm. but the why and the how yeah. behind it. And it's, you know, that passion, it does lead to, I mean, you're chasing thrills. You're a thrill seeker, I think, when you're fishing, especially the way you did it, catching big tarpon and being competitive. And you grew up an athlete and an Olympian and all these things. And I think it could lead to those other devices. It's hard to live that life sometimes or when it abruptly stops or something. And you guys aren't afraid to ask those hard questions. It's, it's cool. important. Because nobody's going to listen unless you ask the hard questions, yeah. I, I think. And I'm not a professional interviewer, and neither is Nikki, but we, you know, we're just swinging you know, by the seat of our pants. But I, 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 I was involved with broadcast work for 20 years in the world of skiing. Mm -hmm. So I got a little bit of a background, but I, you know, but I think we're doing all right. No, you're doing really great. And I was curious, was it a pandemic project or was it something you guys had talked about or were you just wanting to rekindle some of these friendships with people? Well, the root of the problem initially was Nikki couldn't find a real job. <laughs> okay. So he was in New York working as a brand manager with a good buddy of his. He initially was working for the United States Tennis Association writing a train for two hours a day working for minimum wage. And then we moved back to Colorado, he couldn't find a job, even with like Backbone Media, who is a media company for all these outdoor industries. Sure. Or outdoor companies. He couldn't get a job. He said, Dad, I can't get a job. But I've been thinking about doing a podcast, Dad. Let's go interview all these great guys and put their stories, you know, on YouTube so they last for the rest of time. And at the time, I didn't really want to do it because I didn't want to go back to work. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought we're going to really do two great things here. Nikki's going to be really um, embedded now in this fishing space mm -hmm. with this. He's going to gain a lot of respect. He's going to be able to make some money. But most importantly, we're recording and documenting history. Yeah. And, I and that's, why I, that's why I dove all in. I said, yeah, it took a little bit, but once I realized, you know, that if we do this, we're going to do it right. Yeah. And it's, it's important. I feel like we do the same thing in Angler's Journal when we write stories about people, these profiles, it's we're capturing them and some of them are well known and some of them aren't, but they're all unique and they've all got a cool story to tell. Exactly right. And 
I just think as a, as a listener, it's been a lot of fun to learn more about these people. And I was curious to learn more about you and Nikki and how it all came to be. I know you grew up in the mountains from Aspen and you were an athlete and a skier and you started fly fishing pretty young, right? In the streams I, I, and rivers I did. up there. I mean, <clears throat> my family moved to Aspen when I was seven in 1960. I was playing baseball, doing what most kids do. In the winter, I was learning how to ski. Uh, and then I was going to baseball practice. I saw this fly line, you know, arcing horizontally across space. And I thought, wow, that's cool. And I rode my bike over there. It was the great Ernie Schwiebert in town giving casting instructions uh, in, on behalf of uh, the country store, Phil Wright. And uh, I went over and pretty soon I had the, the fly rod in my hand and he's teaching me how to cast and then I was learning how to tie flies. And then instantly I gravitated to, to fly fishing as much as I did to skiing. So my whole life was based on, you know, going fast in the winter and catching fish in the summer. That's cool. And there's got to be some thrills involved there. I mean, I was... I went to school in Colorado and I wasn't really a competitive skier, but I was on the freestyle team and I skied the bumps. Okay, cool. And they always said, you know, you want to be right on that fine line of losing control and just sort of ride that line. And so the stuff you were doing downhill, you know, 60 miles an hour or more, that thrill, I mean, is that what drove you all those years to do all these things? Well, skiing is fun to start with. You know, you're sliding down a mountain like a bird with no rules. Nobody's telling you how slow or fast you can go or not go. Nobody's telling you to make a turn here and there. It's total expression on skis flying with the wind. And that's really cool. And, and then now when you're racing downhill, you're going up to 90 miles an hour. That's crazy. <laughs> you know, now so you're fast. rolling that ski up on an edge and you're ripping around that corner. You're building five G's in that corner. And you feel that edge. If it slips just a little bit, you're losing time. Now it's all in that relationship with that, with that inside edge of the downhill ski, carving that turn and ripping. It's like you're flying a plane. The ski gets out here. It's like riding high-speed uh, motorcycles, Ducatis, you know, where you, uh, you, 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 you basically counter-turn, where you put the ski out here, let the body come inside, and the ski catches up underneath you, just like on a motorcycle. And this is the most amazing sensation. Now... You have a chance to do this against the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And so for five months, you're traveling throughout Europe, and every event you go to is the biggest event for that country. Ski racing is enormous in Europe. Yeah. And now, you know, you have a chance to ski in the Olympics. You know, you've got to be one of the, the, the top four downhillers to ski in the Olympics. So now you're chasing, you know, the epitome, the, the top uh, level of downhill ski racing against all the Europeans. And, and uh, I dedicated my life to it. Yeah, I would imagine it's got to be this mentality of, you know, you you know don't super sleep. focus, training, diet, all these yes. things. And then, I mean, I'm skipping around, but fast forward when you got into all the tarpon tournaments and you got into that world, you were very motivated to win. Well, here's, here's the, the transition and how I approached the whole tarpon tournament thing. I did not know how to win until my very last year as a ski racer. I was always making bad decisions. I did not have a great mentor. I was not smart enough to understand how to win and what it took to win. Putting my team together, the skis, the product, the boots, the technicians who, who prepared my skis, the coaches who taught me or I needed to teach me where to go fast, where you can win, where you can, where you can lose it. The dynamics mm -hmm. of, of, of the whole game of downhill ski racing. My last year, I was about ready to get kicked off the U.S. ski team. And then I won the last downhill of the year. And then I thought, man, this is such a, a great opportunity. And I wasn't taking it that seriously. I thought I was, but I, I didn't really, I was not. But the last year as a skier, I got an Austrian coach. He took me to Europe, he changed my technique. Instead of a knee angulated move, it was a hip angulated move where I can support more pressure on that downhill ski. I started training against the Austrians and now immediately I was skiing among the best in the world. And I hadn't won yet. I was fifth in the pre-Olympics, I was sixth in the Olympics, but I wanted to win. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And now I had a chance. So I go back to, to the beginning of the season, I get fourth right away. I had the fastest training runs in St. Moritz and my ski fell off in the race. And then I go to Vengen, it's a higher in elevation, you know, softer snow, because that hurt my knee when that ski fell off. And I just got caught up because I had a knee operation at Christmas. It was a brief um, um, meniscus repair, arthroscopically. I skipped the two downhills in Europe. I skipped the Kitzbühel, I skipped Garmisch, I go to, I go to Vengen, and I told the coach, I'm gonna go into that first corner as hard as I can, it was my left knee. If it feels good, I'm gonna continue. But the inspection, that last jump into the finish, was really enormous. I said, pay attention here. Well, I had my knee operated on, and now I go back to Bengen. I go to that first corner as fast as I can go. My knee felt great. I got, I got, I got distracted, man. Now I'm racing down the, the course. I'm going, oh, I'm back in it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna win any day now. I went into that last corner way too hot, and right then, just as I was going into that corner, I realized, holy shit, this is so big, and I got launched. I went 200 some feet through the air and landed on the flat, caught an edge and it pulled me in the fence and I broke my neck, my back, my right leg and all the ligaments in my right knee. So my career was over. Dang, just like that. Just like that. So then I got into broadcasting, I had a sure. ski show. And my, my career as a skier was going really up. I was about ready to win and then it flattened out. It was horizontal because I hated broadcasting. I was talking about something I wanted to do. I had a ski show, but I didn't care. Mm -hmm. But then I got offered a job by the Versus Network to do a fishing show. Sportsman's Journal, Yeah, right? Sportsman's Journal. So now I said, you match what I make as a skier, you give me a five-year contract and I'll do it. So I made a career change. So the last 40 years I've been in fishing, I, left, I completely left skiing. <clears throat> I got with Harry Spear, who was my fishing mentor. He taught me, how to be really good. He taught me the nuances of being, of, of, the top, of the top things you have to know to catch fish. And he was one of the most successful guides of all time, he and Steve Huff. So I now in fishing, I had, I had a mentor. Okay. And I didn't even know about tournaments at the time, but he was grooming me to be a tournament fisherman. But you had a drive to get better, better, better. I was just having fun. But once I got, Seven years into the, into the run with Harry, I realized that I was pretty, pretty damn good. So we fished a tournament together. We get second in the spring bonefish tournament. And then we fished the fall fly, fall fly bonefish these tournament. These are, for our listeners, these are all in the keys. These are all the biggest fly fishing, saltwater fly fishing tournaments in the world. They're in the Florida Keys. Mm -hmm. You have a, a spring bonefish tournament, a fall bonefish tournament. You have a couple permit tournaments and, and three tarpon tournaments. Long story short, we win the this, this second, this second tournament, and then at that point, I realized I am not going to lose. <laughs> because then Harry, right after that tournament, he left the game. So now I had to find, you know, Timmy Hoover. We went on and won five gold cups, and I won six golden flies. So I've, I've I mean, it. it's ridiculous hardware, Andy. And, yeah. But to get back, like, to find that guide where you mesh and it works, it can be challenging too. It's, it, it's, it's really hard. And it's so, like finding a wife so, or something. It's well, not... For sure, because what I, I realized in, in, in the, the, the ski world, that's you individual. To, you have to understand, but I needed a team in the ski world. I didn't have a team until my last year. So when I, so when I started tur uh, tournament fishing, I had to figure out, I realized right away, I needed to have a guide that can find the fish that don't want to be found. And I needed to be the angler that can catch a fish that doesn't want to be caught. So now we've got that winning combination. So I was very selective with who I was going to fish. And I didn't know everybody that well, but the tournament success that they previously had, you, you start realizing these guys are good. Now I gotta, I gotta get on their boat. Okay. Like it took me three years to get Dustin Huff to fish the Dale Brown permit tournament. We played rounds and rounds and rounds of golf, begging him, and I finally got him to fish it, and we won the first year we fished it. But I didn't wanna fish that tournament Without. with anybody but Dustin Huff. Why was he reluctant, just not into tournaments? He wasn't doing any tournaments yet. So I think that was the first tournament he fished. 
and then now look what he's doing. So he got a he got a taste of what it's like to win. I'm sure it's intimidating to kind of walk into that room and see those fellows. It's not a big field. It's not like it's 25. Yeah, uh, really, that some of the top top anglers in the world. And you got to know what you're doing, or you're never well, gonna. You know, and for me initially, you know, I was just like, you know, I was impressed. I was like in awe of all these guys. I'd read about them, I'd seen them, I didn't know them very well. And then slowly I started chipping away. And then in the end, it's like, which one of you guys are going to get second? <laughs> but were they accepting of you? Or at first, was it tough to break into that no, clique? No, the fishing people, that, that community is awesome. They're easy, you know. Everybody wants to win, but they're the greatest people in the world. Yeah. And then, and now with the podcast, it's sort of, you're capturing a lot of that magic. We've, what's happened, you know, I think that with the respect that I, that I've earned through the success I've had as a fisherman, and I've always tried to be really a nice guy. Uh, that is first and foremost. I want to, I want to be liked and, and I, I want to share the love. I, I love my fellow man. Um, and I want to be liked. So once I got that respect as a, as a, as a good guy, I think, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, otherwise they wouldn't do these podcasts. You were nice to me, <laughs> invite us into your home, this yeah. is amazing. And, you know, uh, so therefore I can make these calls and get Steve Huff to do yeah. this podcast. Because I don't think Steve Huff is going to do a podcast with just... Yeah, he's... He doesn't do that. He doesn't, yeah. But I call him up and he's said, I'm in. Flip Pallet, I'm in. Steve, Stu Apt, I'm in. Mm -hmm. You know, so... We got the Mount Rushmore of fishing right yeah. away. It's really cool. And then you've sort of branched out. Like I was listening to the interview you did with Ray Rocher. And I started listening to the Carl Hyacin one. I mean, there's a lot of different venues and things these people have done. So well, one of the most interesting interviews we did was not even about fishing. We even talked about a fish because it was Neil Beidelman who was on Mount Everest in 1996 when, they, when all those people died. They got caught in that storm. Neil is a friend of mine from Aspen. He wanted to be a ski racer, and he, he ended up becoming uh, an engineer designing uh, antennas for for satellites. But in the but in between being a skier in college and and designing those, he was a big mountain climber. And he climbed Everest three times, and he was wow. a guide on Everest that night when they got caught in that storm. So the podcast with Neil was all about what happened on Everest in '96. And that was one of our most successful downloads. He had like 75,000 downloads. Wow. Because I think also the climbing community wanted to hear his story. He had never told his story before, but he did it on our podcast because we're pals, you know, but the fishing community wanted to hear his story. That's amazing. Well, you do have some pretty impressive friends looking around the photos in your tackle room and around your house, a lot of time with George Bush and Lefty and Stu and all these interesting people. Yeah, I know, I've been blessed. And it was funny, I, when I was reading your book, um, Passion for Tarpon, which I have around here somewhere, but um, I like the story you wrote about the first time you cast to a tarpon and it ate your fly and it kind of just went crazy, but that was a good story. It was like, yeah, it's just, well, what, what, there's always a moment that will flip that switch. That will make you jump off a cliff to do it again. It's like the first time you had sex. Like, I'm gonna do that again. Oh yeah. And I'm gonna do it a whole go. lot. <laughs> that's what, Every chance I get. That's what like that first harpoon bet was like. I'm gonna do this again. I'm gonna do it a whole lot. I came back to Florida, hired uh, Captain you know, Bob Branham and Harry Spear, and I was all in. And when you were talking about the skiing and when you were getting better and you started talking about the gear and looking around this room, you know gear. I mean, you tie flies. There's a whole row of flies that have been destroyed by tarpon over here that you've hung on to and you've worked with Hardy for a long time and you know gear. I mean, it, that's a big part of the puzzle too, right? The, the gear and the fly rods, um, now there are a lot of fly rods that are great. There are a lot of reels that are great. But when you dive deeper into what that rod can do for you and what that reel can do for you, there is maybe 1% of all fishermen, fly fishermen, that would really understand and be able to use that, just the upper echelon guys, as far as reels. 
you can go f catch anything with a reel. It's a great piece of jewelry. But when you take a closer look at a reel, like, like this one here, this is our new, our new Hardy reel, okay? So you can see how light that is. There's yeah. a lot of space here. You have a drag knob that goes from zero to full drag in one revolution. You're not Why twisting, is that twisting, important? Twisting. Because you don't have time. <laughs> well, no, because what happens is when you catch a big fish, a lot of people will keep turning that drag knob, increasing the tightness of the drag, but they don't know where they are. This is more precise. They don't know where they are. They don't know if I'm at 8 pounds, 10 pounds, 12 pounds, and after an hour of fight, they keep increasing that. Now the fish jumps out of the water and they break, break. off. What you can do with a reel like this, okay, I can put that fly line on, on, a, uh, on, a, on a scale like a boga grip, and I can increase that drag. And when that scale gets to five pounds, I put a mark right there. Mm -hmm. When it gets to eight pounds, it, it can be right there. And I'm right-handed, so I would put that mark right here. I make my own marks yeah. for five. I can go to eight. Much and, like and, and that's 10. I know I'm never going to go above 10. So you have that option, and you know exactly where you are. Yeah. How many reels are made like that? The Mako and ours? Yeah, it's similar to like an offshore conventional reel. You do the same thing. You set yeah, your so drag. if you're record, if you're world record fishing, Super two pound, one pound, etc. But no one in the industry builds a reel like that. So you pick up a reel and they say, well, that's a good looking reel, you know? So it's gonna work for most people, but if you're trying to win tournaments and catch world record fish, you have to understand a little bit more in detail what you're buying and how well it's gonna work for you. So when you got into this, and I could see it became quickly kind of became an obsession for you, or so it seems. Like you said, this is the last 40 years of your life when we walked in the house and you're showing us the art and all these things. Um, how much of your headspace did you spend thinking about all these little things or the flies you're going to use? And the designers design the reels. I tell them what I want. Yeah. So Howard Crossman is the main designer, an Englishman in England. <laughs> Excuse me. He was the world champion freshwater fisherman. So, and he used to also cast uh, long distance championship tournaments. So, when I tell him about a rod, I need it to load a little bit better. I need I need a little bit more ass in to hold that fish. He knows freshwater, but he doesn't. He's not a you know a tarpon fisherman. That's done a lot. He's caught tarpon, yes, but. These are the type of inputs I give these guys. We yeah. got to make a reel like this. We got to make cool. a reel like that. And, and we end up with the, that, that fly rod right there, that one piece, Hardy, is used by more tournament anglers than anybody. In the Gold Cup two years ago, the top seven teams were fishing Hardy. Hmm. They don't break, they're one piece rods. Nobody makes that rod but us. Interesting. And, but even like getting back to the individual stuff, like choosing flies or perfecting your cast. I mean, did you, I know because I read in your book, like Lefty gave you lessons and all these people. It seems like you were open to being coached. Well, I didn't know. But the, 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 the really important thing is that if you're going to be really good and insightful, you have to take the, the knowledge that you've learned from your mentors and expand on that. I was, I was never taught how to cast between the boat. For an example, like if I got wind coming at me at the 12 o'clock and my guide is right here, how do I get a fly out there 80 feet directly to my right? Okay, with a right hand cast. I'm gonna, that backhand cast, I'm gonna pull a fly right in my face. So I gotta realize that I gotta make a forehand cast but without having the fly come to me. So you make a forehand cast back like this, back cast and come forward, but the fly line is coming over my left shoulder. So my rod tip might be over here because it's blowing hard. Yeah. If I do a backhand cast, I'm gonna hook my guide. So you have to understand, how am I comfortable making a cast with my head between my rod and my fly line? And, and not many people teach that. No. But when you're on the boat, 40, 50, 60 days a year fishing all these tournaments, you understand the dynamics of how to make a backhand cast, uh, how you can make the fly go inside the boat, your head between the fly line and your rod. Nobody teaches that. Yeah, and I would imagine, I don't know, what is the, the relationship you normally have with some of your guides? Is it quiet on the boat? Is there some yelling? Is, what's Never the yelling. situation? Never yelling. I realized the first time how serious this stuff was. My very first Gold Cup. What year was that? 
Oh God, I can't remember. Probably early two thousands. I won uh, the first term. I won was nineteen ninety eight. So it was probably the next that next year ninety nine with Harry Spear. We were in Shark, and I'd caught a fish, and I was backing him up. And Harry had his hands on him. He slipped out of his hands. I tried to back him up to, for Harry to grab him again. I broke him off, and Harry stood up and took his hand gaff, and just threw it like into the, under the bottom of the boat so hard. He was pissed. Like. And he screamed, what in the fuck did you do that for? And that's when I realized, hey, this is serious stuff. This is the Super Bowl for these guides and yeah. anglers. This is the epitome. This is like the Olympics. The Gold Cup is like the Olympics of saltwater, shallow water fly fishing, that tarpon Gold Cup. And then I realized, okay, I got it. I know how to do this. But. Like, uh, how hard is it to keep your composure with all that on the line, or do you just not even think <clears throat> about it? You, you, you don't, you, you, it's, a, you, it's a learning curve for sure. Because I think a lot of anglers struggle with that. It's like, you finally have your shot. Don't F it up. Mm -hmm. And well, that, that, those ideas in your brain are what end up, at well, least Well, initially, we're all nervous. You know, when I first started tarpon fishing, I was shaking in my bones. The night before, I couldn't even sleep. If I had to go to the bathroom at one in the morning and, and I happened to look out and see the, the palm trees just, just still, calm, I wouldn't be able to sleep the rest of the night. I was so excited. excited. And, and fishing with Harry, I was just so excited. You can't even breathe. But the more you do it, the, the, the better you get, the easier it is. The more tournaments you fish, you, the, there he is, you just go. Mm -hmm. And you don't even think twice about it. And there's a trust between you and the guy. Oh, you know, absolutely. It's something I always like writing about because you really get to know someone on a boat and I, you know, it's, it's fun and that we, and you become a team and sometimes you need a team. Yeah, well, it is all a team and you have to trust each other. And I'll give you a prime example. One of the best days of guiding was in a gold cup with, with Tim Hoover. We were on Long Key the day before, it was a Wednesday, the day before we caught a big fish. We caught like a 155 and we were in the lead of this tournament. And it's like 12, 12.30, we hadn't even seen a fish. And, and Timmy says, reel up, we gotta make a run. And that meant we we're gonna make a big run. I said, where we're we going? He said, we're going to Key West. I said, wow, <laughs> we get down there, we're gonna only have like an hour and a half left to fish. They got a high tail at that. Then we got to run two hours home or an hour and a half home. I didn't say a word. We ran down there. I made three casts. I caught a 127 and a 117 ran home. Wow. So you just trusted. He knew. And he, he knew. And he trusts me knowing that I can catch him. Yeah. In the Gold Cup, a, a great, the best comebacks of all was in a, in a Gold Cup one year. We were dead last going into the last day. Bad weather, we had bad luck, fish were falling off. And Ken Collette, the great guy that, that's passed, you know, rest in peace, God love, you know, Kenny Collette, but he was with fishing with Azo, a Japanese guy who had won the Gold Cup a couple, three times also. And he yells over to me, he said, hey Andy, you gotta go move your boat. We're in our boat on the starting grid, waiting for the, for the blast of the horn to take off. He tells me I've got to go, go move my truck because it's, it's got a bad luck on the parking spot because I park there every day. He said, your parking spot's got bad mojo, dude. Oh, I wasn't sure where you were going with yeah. this. You've you got to go move your truck. I said, really? He said, you're dead last. You're always in the top three going into the last day. You got to move your truck, dude. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, Timmy, we got to go move, move our truck. Let's go. And Timmy it was not up for it at all. Timmy Hoover. I said, got we gotta move my truck. So I get my, key, get my bag out, get my keys, run over, move my truck, you know, three blocks away, run back, jump in the boat. I said, Timmy, this is the first nice day we've had. You find me the fish, I'm gonna catch them. And the field is only two 70 pound fish ahead of us. Nobody was catching good fish. We had five bites and caught all fish, in, all five fish in one. Damn, last but, day. Last day. But there you go. It's, it's a guide that can find the fish and an angler that can catch them. And now in the tournaments, there are a lot of guys that are really good, anglers and, and, and guides. So when you kind of segued out of fishing tournaments and just was, were fishing for fun, were you still fishing with those same guides or were you doing it more on your own? Uh, no, 
No, I just started fishing with my son. And who, who pulls the boat or do you guys take turns? Oh, we just pull each other. What happened was, you know, after we won five gold cups, I think we fished one more year, then Timmy didn't want to fish tournaments anymore. And I fished two tournaments with uh, Dale Perez. And, and, and right at that point, my wife had left me. I lost my family and fishing meant nothing to me. I lost, I lost my life, I lost my family, I lost my base. And it's like, what am I doing here? I, you know, the priorities completely changed. I had to go save my life, because I was toast. I was, so you were married to Chris Everett, mm -hmm. and that's when all this happened. And yeah, when she left me, it's like, I had to find a place to live, I lost my family, the dynamics of, of my family, and it's like, my world collapsed. And so I just left fishing. Okay. What brought you back to it? Oh, uh, I never totally left fishing. I just had to take a, you know, a big departure. Uh, but fishing with my son brought me back, you know? I mean, there's nothing better than spending a day with Nikki on the boat. Yeah. He's so good. He is so good. He learned so well. And initially, I had to lean on him a little bit. And he talks about, why do you yell at me so much? I said, Nikki, because I knew you were, you were in the game. I knew that, that I, could, I could mold you, I could push you, because you were already in. Mm. You can't do that with all kids. If initially, it's just playing with you know, snappers and this and that, playing this, playing with a mullet, and then all of a sudden, he gets a little older. He caught his first tarpon when he was 11 on a, you know, a nice big fish, 12 years old. And then I realized he, he loved it. Then I realized I, I could push this kid. And he's so athletically, you know, He's a superstar when it comes to, you know, hand-eye coordination and being an athlete. He's world class in six sports. So I knew this kid was ready. He was hungry, okay. and I pushed him. And he's as good as anybody. I, I promise you. Do you you have two other sons, right? Do they fish and hunt too? Or they never gravitated to that. They were skateboarders. They raced motocross, you know. But they never got the fishing bug. Okay. So with, with Nikki, he fished a number of tournaments. You know, he got second. He got second in the Golden Fly. He got third in the Holly. But then he kind of left it, you know, because he's, you know, doing the podcast and he got married and all that. He might fish the Gold Cup one day, but who knows. That's nice. And you guys, I mean, you have two beautiful skiffs in the back there and you guys fish mostly down in the Keys? Or yeah, wherever? yeah, we rent a house. And we, we, we rent a house on Sugarloaf Key. And uh, or near there behind the square group, and we'll fish for six weeks every day, just the two of us. And we'll have a camera, that guy that'll come in and, and create some content that we, you know, for our sponsors that we have. Uh, he's my best friend, and then we go to Colorado and go into the high country and, and hunt elk all fall. That's pretty amazing. I've got two little kids, and I totally get what you're saying. Like, one of them's really into it, and I want them to be into it, and I want them to have fun, but sometimes you can't help but bark at them a little or. You know, you can encourage them. You just can't push until they're ready. Yeah. And 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 wrong. and I and I had that feeling with because I knew the other guys didn't want to do it. So I, how can you push somebody who's out? They don't they don't want to do it. It's like trying to force somebody to love you. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work so well. It does not work. And so the competitive side was the driver, and now it's really that passion and and sharing these stories and capturing all this cool. Um, historical stuff. Um, so what's what's next on the plate? You know, it's I've had such a great life, such a great run that it, right now it's it's really about giving back. You know, to conservation, just to preserving these stories, and doing the best I can without getting you know burned out on doing it, because it's important for me to still have fun in my life to still. I need to start working out because I've had 24 operations, you know, three in my shoulders the last few years. I just had my neck fused in June. Um, I, need to, I need to build up my foundation so I can still do the things well that I like doing and not get hurt because I love being in the high country chasing elk. But if, if, my, if I'm not strong enough, I can't pull my bow back, I can't carry my pack, I can't carry the meat out, you know, that whole world's going to go away. But that's kind of cool. So it's these desires that are keeping you... Keeping me young. Yeah. I mean, but if I didn't have Nikki, uh, you know, who knows what I'd be. I'd probably still be chasing elk, but he's the drive that 
really kind of keeps me in the game for sure. Yeah, you said something cool to me when we were walking around and you were showing me some of your trophies and stuff. And you said that the house is like a museum of a career. And um, I can see it. What are some of your favorite pieces you have here? There's oh, so much well, cool you know, a lot of photographs with my friends. Because when it's all said and done, it's not about the winning, it's about the journey. And it's like the philosopher Thoreau said, many men go fishing their entire lives without knowing it's not the fish they're after. And that sums it up. Yeah. So when I look around, it's, you know, you see great, I love, I love original oils. I, I just, and the underwater genre is just captivating to me. I just love great artwork. But the photos of this, like this elk that my son killed, I called in for him. Uh, it was really cool and how that elk was killed because I do the MC work for the Hall of Fame, for the IGFA Hall of Fame induction ceremony in September, right during elk season. So I fly to Missouri and Nikki calls me right after I get to the hotel room, he goes, Dad. And I can tell it was his voice, he was really excited. I almost, killed, I almost killed a good one tonight. I said, what happened? He said, I was full draw and a cow busted me and I, I didn't get it. And I said, well, don't go, because the next night was a Saturday for the event and I was gonna be back in Aspen on Sunday at noon. I said, don't go in there tomorrow rest it and I'll get back on Sunday we'll go in there we'll find him and we'll kill him blah 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 that never happens mm -hmm. well we went in that Sunday evening we found that elk I called him in and Nikki killed him wow so that's the type of stuff I with do with yeah with a bone arrow I mean that's the type of stuff Nikki and I do you know we do we really fulfill dreams big dreams that most people just dream about but we've actually been able to go out and and, and fulfill uh, these great things that we've always wanted to do in your book, it's funny you say that because I wrote this quote down that you said um, that you wondered what pulled you more, the spirit or the dream. So that's kind of interesting that it would be that. And people do dream about this stuff and we get these rare opportunities and make the most of it. Look, I think, I think we live vibrantly when we're chasing dreams. Not dreaming dreams, but when you're actually chasing them. A lot of people have big dreams, but it takes a big effort to go run those things down. Um, like when we were, when I had my run chasing down these tournaments, I didn't sleep for 15 years. I was always messing with knots and pulling on scales and trying to figure out, pulling on scales in my garage, trying to figure out how much, a certain amount, what is 12 pounds in my hands? Because you can't set 12 pounds on your drag, it's too tight. They're gonna jump out of the water and break you off. That drag has gotta be like three to five pounds, like nothing. So you hang onto your fly line, you pull 12 pounds, but you gotta know what 12 pounds feels like. I lived in my garage pulling on scales for years. Tying knots, tying flies. That's, that's the journey that, that really, um, that I lived for and I love the journey. Yeah, it, winning is everything too. I say everything because then your then your dreams come true. I want to win that, but it's the journey where we live vibrantly, chasing those dreams, trying to be the best in the world at something. Yeah, winning doesn't happen by accident. No, it takes a lot of work, man. It takes a, it's, it, you have to dedicate your life to it, and that's what I did. I dedicated my life to to being an Olympic skier. And I was so fortunate to have a second chance in fishing. And when I got into the game, it's like, man, I'm not letting up because I didn't win as a skier. I was the best skier in the country. I had won big events, but I wasn't. I didn't win at the World Cup or Olympic medal. People say, I, I, I say this, man, you were a great skier, man. You skied in four world championships and skied in two Olympics. I said, I was not great. The great ones win those things. And if you want to be known, you look at anybody in tennis, the great players, they all won the grand slams in, in golf, in fishing. Oh, I finished third in the, in the Gold Cup three or four times. I did this. Your name is forgotten on Monday. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to have a legacy in, in what you did, you've got to win. Good people are not remembered the greats are and you got to win to be great it's powerful stuff
and it's you got to win over and over and over and now you know doing all this stuff with your kid and I think it's, it seems like a, a nice circle well for sure because you can't keep winning things we win with a great balanced life we we we, we win with a passionate heart so my heart was filled chasing stuff early in life and raising a family and now my my heart is filled just by being happy and knowing that, you know, a lot of the things that I chased down uh, were successful. And that really is, a, is I, I feel at ease now because I really wanted the, these things. So what's the perfect day on the water these days? Just being with my son. Do you, all right, one big fish or... Steady I, action all day. My last fish would be waiting for a tailing 14-pound bonefish. I love the organic setting where uh -huh. it's just the sea breeze, you, a little bit of ripple of the water if you're maybe waiting knee-deep or whatever, the, the, the silence of nature. But the silence is actually quite loud. The birds... The wind yeah, going the through wind, trees. The waves. That's what I gravitate to. I don't want to be on a boat with somebody. I mean, with Nikki, that's always a paradise with him. And we're whacking a bunch of tarpon, you know. And he, Dad, there he are. It's 8 o'clock. You see him, Dad? Here he comes, you know. And slide in there. Boom, I catch one. Or I'm pulling him. Nikki, you got that fish over there? But I never see a fish before him. He's always, <laughs> Dad, you see that fish coming over there? And I won't see it for ten, five minutes, you know. Sure. But being with him is, is everything. But if it's one fish to, uh, that we're talking about, it would be probably waiting for a big tailing bonefish. There is a monster bonefish over there on your that, workbench. That's a 12 pound, three ounce fish I caught in the spring fly. That thing is huge. I caught that with Timmy Hoover down on, on Boot Key and, and the thing died. And I called uh, King Sailfish Mount, and, uh, Mounts and Douglas came up and got it and mounted yeah. it for me. That's beautiful. There's so much fun stuff in your house to look at and so many cool stories. It's been a pleasure sitting down chatting with you. Oh, no, no, it's, yeah, the pleasure's all mine, thank you. And I, I think what you're doing with Millhouse is really great for the sport and to capture all these stories. And, you know, we try to do that in Angler's Journal too. And for anyone who's interested, check out Millhouse on Spotify, I'm sure, and all these spots. Spotify, you can watch it on YouTube. YouTube. You know. And we'll do a little story in the magazine in Angler's Journal about you and Nikki and this, you know, journey you've been on capturing these stories and talking to all these in interesting folks. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. All right, Charlie, thank you, buddy. Thanks, Andy. It. Ian, you too, buddy. <laughs> Make sure to look for a follow-up article about our time with Andy Mill in an upcoming edition of English Journal Magazine.